My name is Vincent Lavery, born and raised in Dunleary and left Dunleary when I was 20 and I went to America and I came back after 50 years in America. At 20 years of age, I jumped on an airplane from Shannon and I got to Seattle, Washington on the 6th of July, 1956, and I was sworn into the United States Army 13 days later. Uh, the, the, the brief story there is that my brother wasn't married at the time, and that's why I went out to visit. And after a few days, we realized we loved each other as brothers, but he was a very, very uh, successful businessman. As far as working in business together, it just didn't quite work out. We argued, I remember the second night I was there, whether we'd get tomato soup or pea soup. And the fifth day, we argued on how to tie a package. So I realized pretty quickly we'd better stop this business venture together. And I uh, signed up, went into the Army, and wound up in the 82nd Airborne Division, jumping out of airplanes. I was 20, 23, and uh, I was doing what I wanted to do. I made 25 jumps, nearly got killed on the 13th. Uh, lucky 13, the fickle finger of fate nearly got me. And um, But uh, when I look back on those three years in the Army, uh, I remember the first few weeks uh, they gave us a bayonet. We were out in practice and there was yellow straw dummies. And this, of course, was just after Korea. And we had to get and go up to the straw dummy and plunge the bayonet into it. And as we did, we had to shout out in a loud voice, kill, gook, kill, which, of course, was a very racist term. And I remember thinking, you know, that there's something wrong about this. Uh, this person that I'm shoving the bayonet into has a mother, father, brother, sisters, children of their own. And it was just my, one of my first reactions while in the military as to my opposition to killing. There's a man with a gun over there telling me I got to beware. Then I got out of the army for two years and I went back into the Air Force for four more. <laughs> so, so obviously it was a slow process. So I spent seven years altogether in the armed forces of the United States. They sent me to Florida when I went into the Air Force, Orlando, Florida, and I wrote a letter to the base newspaper criticizing the price of orange juice on the base pointing out how Orlando was the heart of the orange industry and a glass of orange juice at the military federal base was more expensive than Times Square. They didn't publish that letter, uh, which made me think that this wasn't very democratic. And I, I can't connect the dots, but as a result of, of my protests, while that first year in Florida, they sent me up to the North Pole, to Thule, Greenland. And it was there that I uh, became a disc jockey on, on Armed Forces Radio. Five after six, and here we go with another day's version of the Don Buster Show from Armed Forces Radio. And for the next four hours, we've got the best in popular music for you here, so let's get started right now with music. I left in 65, and well, I was 27 years of age, and I got out, and I realized I knew how to jump out of airplanes. I knew how to type 50 words a minute, and I knew how to take Greg shorthand, and I knew how to operate a keyboard uh, at a radio station. I knew how to kill. So I looked in the local newspaper to see if there was any jobs for male paratroop killers, typists, shorthand experts, and there wasn't. <laughs> I decided then that what I wanted to do with my life was to be a teacher, a secondary school teacher, and I went to university. And in those days, uh, going at 27 was uh, a little unusual because uh, that was, quote, a little old to start university. But um, uh, I made it through seven years of university. I read a letter in 1967 from a doctor in New York City critical of an uh, uh, article the Time magazine had just published uh, and the article suggested who the Democrats might <clears throat> nominate to run in the 68 election. It talked about Johnson of course was certain to run and Hubert Humphrey may challenge him and Eugene McCarthy and the, the, the gist of the letter was that um, it didn't mention Robert Kennedy and the, the doctor in New York pointed out that Kennedy was a potential candidate to run in 68 
and that he, Dr. Shepard, in New York, had started a grassroots organization called Citizens for Kennedy Fulbright. I tracked down the doctor from California and called him, and he said, wonderful, wonderful, start your own organization. So with that, the grassroots organization, by the time Kennedy announced in March of 68, there was a national grassroots organization already in place, even though uh, up to mid-March, people really did not think Robert Kennedy was going to take on Eugene McCarthy in the primaries. What I think is quite clear is, is that we can work together. For a year and a half, I literally worked for him, and a lot of people say I knew him, and I've met people of power and 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 uh, history in in my life, as we all have. But uh, I did know Robert Kennedy. By that I mean he knew me by first name, and his wife knew me by first name. And uh, had he become president, I would have got a job somewhere working in the Kennedy administration, maybe as dog catcher or something. But I definitely would have got a job because what happened was the grassroots organization I started in the Central Valley in California, uh, the highest percentage of the vote for Kennedy resulted from that organization in the state on, on election night. disenchantment with our society, the divisions, whether it's between blacks and whites, between the poor and the more affluent, or between age groups or on the war in Vietnam, that we can start to work together. We are a great country and a selfish country and a compassionate country. And I intend to make that my basis for running and over the period of the next year. My thanks to all of you, and now it's on to Chicago and let's win there. With the death of Robert Kennedy, uh, a lot of changes occurred, not just in my life, but of course around the world, I would argue. Enjoyed everything I've done in my life. I don't regret anything. I fully engaged with it. There was no, no force made me do it. I did it as a, as a free man with free will. My name is Vincent Lavery, born and raised in Dunleary and left Dunleary when I was 20 and I went to America and I came back after 50 years in America. I got to Seattle, Washington on the 6th of July 1956 and I was sworn into the United States Army 13 days later. The President reaffirms United States policy in South Vietnam in a talk to the Association of American Cartoonists. The Vietnam War, when I was in the 82nd Airborne Division in Fort Bragg, North Carolina, as a soldier I started protesting that war. It didn't go down very well, but I remember having a conversation with a lieutenant, or lieutenant as they say in Ireland, and he said, of course, don't tell any of my fellow officers that we're having this conversation. I worked in the judge advocate's office and I was a typist and he was a, an attorney, a lawyer. So I, I, this was the beginning of Vietnam, 58, 59, 60. And I remember saying to him, the Americans cannot win in Vietnam. And his response was, what are you talking about? All they have is bicycles and they run around in pajamas and shower shoes and they've all they've got is revolvers. And I said, they won't win for the same reason as the British couldn't defeat the Irish in 800 hundred years. And he looked at me and he said, I don't get the analogy. And I said, well, read the, read the history of Ireland and you'll understand when people want freedom, no matter how long it takes, they eventually achieve it. And the same will be true about Viet the Vietnamese. And of course, unfortunately, it took two million Vietnamese and 60,000 Americans dead before that final massacre ended. You're old enough to kill, but not for voting. You don't believe in war. I pledge to you, we shall have an honorable end to the war in Vietnam. The docks on Tuesday morning were crammed with thousands of Vietnamese desperate to escape from Saigon by any means possible. Then I got out of the army for two years and I went back into the Air Force for four more. <laughs> My last year in the Air Force in Central California, I um, got into a talent contest and I, I read poetry, uh, which was in itself a rather interesting thing to do, to read poetry before two, 
2,000 young young American airmen. But I did a poem called uh, by Carl Sandberg, The Man with the Broken Fingers, and it was seven minutes long. And as a result of that, I got into, I moved up in the comp- competitive level and got to the worldwide armed forces level. And in the course of that, I, I met a band called the Echoes, who were part of, from the base that I was uh, stationed at and I said why don't we go downtown in, in, in Central California and play when we get back and make a bit of money or have a bit of fun. As a result of that I got into the band promotion business. I got groups like Van Morrison and them and Jefferson Airplane, Grace Slick, brought them all to Merced but to, the, 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 to, to get to the point I heard about this group playing in Los Angeles at the Whiskey A Go-Go called The Doors and I went down and listened to them and I said my god this group is fantastic. So I signed them up for four contracts uh, four gigs uh, pay them two hundred three hundred dollars a night and the first week they came 82 people came to see them because nobody had ever heard of them and as a result of that that week light my fire broke and Ray Mansarek the organist uh, asked me if I would become their manager Girl, we couldn't get much higher he said, you seem like a pretty honest person and something rather unique in this industry. And so I said, uh, as a matter of fact, his quote was, if we don't get somebody to control Jim, he'll be dead in five years. And of course, he was dead in a little over five years. But I uh, turned to down. The interesting thing is that Jim Morrison and I, I'd studied Oscar Wilde uh, all my life. I've been a, somewhat of a, an expert on Oscar Wilde. And there's a m- remarkable similarity between the Oscar Wildes of the world and the Jim Morrisons of the world. Jim Morrison called the group The Doors because he wanted to go beyond the normal side of the door that most of us are content living. He wanted to go beyond. And Oscar Wilde in the 1890s, the first half of the decade, he strutted. The second half, he staggered. And so between the two people, not that I advocate their life, lifestyles, but they are part of the human homo sapien experience. That's why they both fascinate me. Well, I always feel that everybody is destined for greatness and everybody has a book in their life. And when people say you've met all these interesting people, you know, I find the taxi driver or the, or the night shop worker from midnight to eight just as fascinating. And I, I, I'm, just, I'm just not excited about people who are famous, quote, quote. I think we're all famous. Uh, these people that I did have the opportunity to associate with in a small degree uh, made my life. They had an impact on it. And hopefully, as a result of that, I have impacted other people's lives, hopefully for the better. The day I left to come back to Ireland for a holiday was the day Bobby Sands died. It was the headline in the, in the, in the New York Times, Bobby Sands is dead. And uh, f- five days later, uh, Raymond McCreesh, the third hunger striker, died. So for whatever reason, I went up to Belfast, went to Camlock, I went to the funeral of, 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 the, of the third hunger striker. And uh, I saw so many things during that visit uh, that uh, just made me sick in the stomach. The RUC station at New Barnsley in West Belfast came under fire from a heavy machine gun. Last November, the IRA has killed 19 people. I came back to Fresno and I gave a talk to the Lions Club about Northern Ireland and was asked, what could we do about it? And I said, well, I don't know what you're going to do, but I'm going to put a Catholic and a Protestant child together, no politics, no religion, bring them over to the United States for seven weeks and give them a holiday. This had never been done before, bringing children out of war-torn zones, putting them together without any proselytizing. And NBC made a movie on it called Children in the Crossfire and... Uh, the great Irish actor Neil Tobin played me in the movie, and um, it was a, uh, the program lasted 15 years. It expanded into Lebanon, put Christian and Muslim children. 